Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Asian Americans are the highest income, best educated, and fastest growing racial group in the United States, according to a 2012 survey by the Pew Research Center. They comprised almost 6% of the U.S. population during the last census and 13% of New York City's population, a 110% increase since 1990. What has caused this growth in the Asian American population? And given their label as the model minority, are there any issues that bedevil them at all? How are Asian immigrant workers faring in New York City? How involved are they in politics? And what are their daily lives like? Shirley Lung, a professor at the CUNY School of Law and the granddaughter of Chinese immigrants, is well qualified to address this subject. Before coming to the law school, she was executive director of the Center for Immigration Rights, and she has worked on labor issues affecting Chinese garment, restaurant, and construction workers. She also served on the board of directors of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. So, you know, in the last decade, it's been very noticeable to me that there have been a lot more Asian a lot more Asian Americans in the city. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned some of the numbers earlier. What's caused this increase? Well, there's a lot of reasons that would cause the increase of, of migration. Uh, there's a lot of dislocation that is occurring in people's home countries in China and in other parts of Asia, not just in East Asia, but in South Asia and Southeast Asia. That's caused by uh, corporatization and globalization where people are being displaced from their homes in, uh, in the rural countryside, uh, where people are being drawn to the cities to work in very low-wage factories globally. And these conditions begin, you know, begin to deteriorate, and it causes people to have to search for better opportunities, better life, better lives in other countries. And so one of the places of, uh, of migration that many people from China and other parts of Asia come to would be is, is the United States. And we see that particularly in New York City. There's a great attraction here in terms of employers who are willing to hire uh, immigrant workers and particularly undocumented immigrant workers uh, to perform uh, jobs that for which they get paid very low wages. Right. So there you have both push and pull factors uh, in, in terms of the immigration jargon, right. why people would be coming to to the United States and into New York City in particular. Are there more? Now, I read that there were about 1.2 million Asian Americans in New York City. Do we have more Asian Americans than San Francisco, say, or is it about the... Uh, about the, the biggest populations are in in L.A., in, uh, in New York, I think followed by maybe uh, New York trails San Francisco mm -hmm. by a bit. But the population of, of, of Chinese immigrants uh, uh, to New York City has jumped tremendously uh, just between the 13-year period between 2000 and 2013, where the percentage increased by about 35 or 30, 35 to 37 percent. Mm -hmm. So there are many reports that basically indicate that in New York that Chinese immigrants are poised to become the largest single uh, immigrant community in, in New York in, in the next few few years. Okay. Now, where are the Asian, the Asian Americans in New York? I know they're all over, but there tend to be some heavy concentrations in certain neighborhoods. Yes, uh, concentrations uh, in, in Brooklyn and in Queens, so in Flushing, Queens, and in Brooklyn, in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, as well as in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and then, of course, also in New York's Chinatown. If you take the Q train, the N train, the R train into Brooklyn, uh, you see that there are Chinese communities, Asian American communities that basically proliferate right in those neighborhoods, Coney Island, Ditmas Park, Gravesend, uh, Bay Ridge. Uh, so it's, it's, it's expanded right throughout Brooklyn and, and then Queens and Flushing is the other. Right, and certainly I teach at, at Queens College and if you get off uh, the train at uh, Main Street, you know, it's like being in China. You yeah, know, it really yeah, is. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a, a socioeconomic hierarchy among Asian Americans, depending on what countries they are from. Indians seem to, uh, to be the best educated, uh, sort of high income. Um, Chinese seem to be sort of somewhere in the middle. Bangladeshis, Vietnamese tend to be sort of in the bottom. Is that pretty accurate? 
when we think about my uh, Asian immigrant communities in New York City, it's, it's very, very diverse. And so even uh, between China, right, immigrants from China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Vietnam, and there are differences in the patterns with, between the groups and also within the groups. And so it's, it's hard to speak in generalities. Uh, there are certain, maybe have, have been certain uh, immigrants from India uh, from the 1960s maybe, who were more professional, who were getting, coming here for education, who might have had technical or science, science degrees. Uh, and we might see that to, uh, there are greater numbers of immigrants uh, from Singapore, Taiwan, who might, be speak, who might speak English and who come with college degrees. But what's interesting to me is that there's uh, greater numbers of immigrants from Asia who are basically coming as unauthorized uh, as undocumented immigrants. Right. And for instance, the uh, Department of Homeland Security estimates that uh, the undocumented immigrants from India is the fastest rising group of undocumented immigrants. From India? Yes. In New York, uh, across the nation, there are about 1.5 uh, million a uh, Asian immigrants who are undocumented immigrant workers comprising about 14% of the 11 million undocumented workers in uh, undocumented immigrants in the United States. Uh, and, and so it's really important that though we may have this idea of model minorities within um, the Asian community that there, there are groups, right, Im of immigrant workers and immigrant communities. Reach all the way across the spectrum. All across the spectrum, right, who basically face very exploitative and oppressive working conditions. Right. In our very own city, right? Right. right. The Supreme Court recently heard a challenge to President Obama's executive order that sought to give working rights and protections against deportation to the immigrant parents of children who are born in the U.S. Uh, that has not been decided yet, I gather. Uh, how important is this decision, uh, is a decision in this case for Asian American immigrants? The programs, like you're referring to the DAPA program and uh, also the, an earlier program, uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Re uh, Arrivals, DACA, were basically part of uh, President Obama's executive action to basically to try to provide relief for, for deportation for uh, for undocumented uh, youth who had come, been brought to the United States at a certain age, and then also later for parents of a certain American citizens and certain per people with legal permanent resident status. And so any opportunity to provide people who are undocumented immigrants with relief from deportation and uh, work authorization is, is very important, and it affects the Latino community and the Asian community as well. Right? So there are numbers, like this would benefit many committees, uh, communities, so that people could come out of the shadows or people don't have to continue to labor uh, under exploitative conditions where their immigration status, undocumented immigration status, is used against, the, mm -hmm. against them. Now, do we have any idea of what percentage of the Asian Americans in New York City are undocumented? You know, I don't have, I couldn't find specific figures about that. I only found that... Uh, in terms of national figures that uh, China, China is the fifth largest origin of country uh, for undocumented mm -hmm. immigrants across the country. Okay. Uh, and that uh, another interesting figure is that since 1990, the number of undocumented immigrants from China, Korea, and India has increased respectively fourfold, eightfold, and tenfold. Wow. I don't know what the specific figures of the undocumented um, uh, population for, for Chinese immigrants are But there's more City. undocumented immigrants coming. Yes, okay. yes, right. The Peter Liang case got a lot of publicity in recent months. He was the rookie New York City cop who accidentally shot and killed a Kai Gurley, an unarmed African-American man who was walking in the staircase of a Brooklyn housing project. Liang was convicted of, was it manslaughter or was it kicked down lower? I think it might have been kicked down low. Okay, okay. Um, but he received no jail time, probation only. What's been the uh, reaction to this case and this sentence in the Asian American community? Well, of course it's been varied, right? At, in any community, there's going to be a variety of opinions. I think on the one hand, there were members of the Asian uh, community uh, who were upset about the 
conviction, the indictment and conviction of Officer Liang because they, they perceived that there was discriminatory treatment because that there had been police officers who appeared to have committed more egregious acts resulting in excessive use of force where and were never indicted, and were never, never tried. indicted or, 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 or never indicted or tried. Uh, and so there were members of the Asian American community who were upset, although they were uh, aware that an innocent man had lost his life. And then there were other members in parts of the Asian American community who really believe strongly that the police should be hold, held accountable when innocent, unarmed uh, black Americans and other uh, individuals who are killed uh, by the police when there's no reason for that. So it was, as in any it's, community, it's, it's, there, there's right there are different complex reactions and there's a variety of reactions. Right, just as it was in the African American community. Uh, do you get a sense of um, uh, what race relations between Asian Americans in New York City and African Americans are like if they're yeah, in the communities that I've worked with, in the independent worker centers that I've worked with, uh, such as the National Mobilization Against Sweatshops on the Lower East Side, uh, the Chinese Staff and Workers Association in China, that, uh, and they're not the only ones, but they're independent worker centers that are basically trying to build uh, different racial, cultural, and ethnic groups together to fight the same conditions that they experience of gentrification in their communities, of displacement in housing, of working in low-wage jobs where employees are robbing them of their wages. And the idea of that is that if elected officials, public officials, and others are allowed to divide communities, immigrant communities, from native-born communities and divide communities along racial and ethnic lines, then the communities have a much tougher time in terms of fighting back a legal system that allows employers to basically uh, have a lot of impunity in terms of worker exploitation. And it also hurts the ability of communities to come together to basically fight back forces of gentrification, right? And, and uh, when public space is being denied to communities of color and communities of color that are low, uh, located in low income areas. And so in the communities that I work with, that there's a real importance of bringing people together along all ethnic uh, and racial, uh, racial groups. Because they have important. a lot of common interests. Because interest. it has a lot in common, and it's so easy for people to basically try to divide groups based on ethnicity and race. And this happens not only across groups, but also within groups as well, within right. immigrant groups, dividing Im one immigrant group against another or even within the same community dividing newcomers from people who have immigrated a long time ago. That is very easy for employers and others to basically try to create division, uh, division to divide workers right. uh, and to divide communities. And so there's a real attempt by many of the creative uh, organizing work that's going on with independent worker centers and other social justice movements in recognition that we need to bring people together. And we, and we see that happening. Mm -hmm. It is happening. Okay. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with CUNY Law Professor Shirley Long. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Shirley Lung, a professor at the CUNY Law School. So let's talk about the Asian American low wage workers. Um, they're the garment work. Are there a lot of Asian Americans in the garment industry? Yes, there are. Historically, the garment industry was a place that attracted immigrant workers at the turn, Period. Of, right, at the turn of the century. It was Eastern European, Jewish immigrant, uh, largely many who were uh, immigrants fleeing uh, a persecution because they were Jewish. And then it's uh, most recently, or uh, since the 1960s, has been Asian Chinese immigrant workers in, in, New, York's, in New York City. Right. Right. garment industry. And of course you have the restaurant workers, uh, construction workers. Construction workers as well, hotel workers, nail salon workers, delivery workers. You basically think of any kind of, of service retail industries. And who are getting screwed to a, to a large degree. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how bad is that? It's extremely bad. What we call wage theft, which is basically employers 
underpaying workers, not paying the minimum wage, not paying overtime, not even sometimes paying wages at all in violation of federal, state, and labor laws. Stealing is, tips. Stealing tips, exactly. That phenomenon is extremely pervasive in many industries, and it's been written about, and it's gained quite a bit of both local uh, and national attention. And it's really important that what Asian immigrants are facing in terms of wage theft and these violations of the la uh, of labor laws, basic labor laws and protections, is something that many immigrant groups are experiencing in whatever industries that they're working with. And so it's interesting to see that largely there's a large part of our economy, both our city economy and our national economy, that is basically a low-wage economy that's right. based on exploitation. And why does that happen is because, uh, for many reasons, one is the a very weak, I think, a very weak legal system that enables employers to basically violate labor laws with impunity. Uh, we have uh, employers who will use immigration laws uh, against undocumented immigrant workers who, who protest and who challenge to try to undermine their ability to do that, and who will also then use undocumented workers to basically extract the same kinds of, 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 of uh, long hours and subminimum wages from, from documented workers, including U.S. citizen workers. So there's an immigration system and a labor law system that basically gives employers a great deal, uh, unscrupulous employers, a great deal of, of power. Uh, and we see it not only, but I think it's also important, like as recent cases having to do with challenging McDonald's and Domino's liability in terms of them as joint employers or as franchises who should be liable for the, way, uh, the wage violations committed by franchisees, that it's not just small employers, it's also uh, corporate employers are involved in basically maintaining in, uh, a system of low wage of, of low wages and exploitation. To the problem of lack of enforcement of the labor laws, because we have the labor laws that guarantee certain kinds of wages and certain kinds of conditions, and it's just nobody enforcing them, or not enough people enforcing them? Lack of resources for the enforcement, that lack of resources for investigators, not enough investigators. Not In New York, enough. it would be what, the Division of Labor Standards? Yes, yeah, we have labor laws, right, governing the minimum wage and overtime on the books. But we also have a legal system where it's very easy, if, even if when employ, workers do come to basically challenge employees, robbing them of their wages, and they're successful and they get judgments right issued by court, it's really hard for them to make good on these judgments because employers can flout the labor laws by basically transferring property, by basically uh, declaring bankruptcy, transferring assets, so that they basically are judgment proof, mm -hmm. right, in the face of, of workers who basically have gotten, who've gotten litigated wage claims against their employers. So what kind of policy reforms do we need in order to, uh, policy reforms, action, will, I don't know if it's just a matter of willpower, what do we need to address what's going on? Well, what's happening is that we see on the ground at, in New York City and, and, and also this hap is happening and has happened in other cities, basically uh, trying to organize, uh, create movements of workers to organize to basically to pass uh, strengthen state laws, make it harder for employers to move their property, provide for attachment, prejudgment attachment of employer property so that, uh, that if they are found liable for wage violations that the employees will be able to be paid their wages. Uh, there's a current uh, so, a group called the Sweat Campaign which is basically trying to get such labor laws passed in New York State. Also, we have something that's called a mechanics lien in recognition of the fact that uh, construction contractors and subcontractors should be able to put a mechanics lien on someone's property if they're not paid for their services or for the materials. And so some, the sweat campaign is interested in trying to pass state legislation that would expand these mechanics liens to workers' liens for workers to be able to uh, place liens on property when pending a lawsuit uh, for uh, against the employer for violating uh, wage and hour laws. Does there seem to be any impetus for that in the state legislature? Well, the, the last time there was some movement was in, in 2013 where Assemblywoman Linda Rosenthal sponsored a bill and on the Senate side, Senator Peralta spa, uh, uh, sponsored the bill on the Senate, Senate side. And so what we see with 
with any kind of legal reform, it's a sustained effort, right? So with the sweat campaign, the recognition is that there was some movement made, recognition on the part of legislators of this, of this very big problem. And uh, the sweat campaign is basically has a wide coalition of groups to continue to press on this to, to create pressure and momentum uh, so that the whole legislature takes this up. Now, most of the organization among the low-wage workers has not been union efforts. The unions are, I don't know what's happened with the unions. And I think it's down to like, what's the percent unionized workers? In the private sector, in the private sector it's 6.7 percent. Okay. Uh, in the public sector, it's about 35 percent. Teachers, right. firefighters, right. police workers. Uh, and overall, on average, I think the estimates are that it's uh, one in 10 workers a part of a right. quote union. So, we're, I, but I know that uh, in the sort of non-unionization kind of organization, the domestic workers started organizing a few years ago. I know there's been uh, demonstrations by and organizing by fast food workers. Uh, retail workers have they made any gains? Yes, these groups and other groups have made quite a bit of have made many gains, and they are going outside of the traditional framework of the National Labor Relations Act. Some of them have to do it because they're excluded; they're not protected by the National Labor Relations Act, such as domestic workers and farm workers. So we saw in twenty. Uh, uh, in 2010, the enactment of the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, right, in New York State. That was the result of a campaign of many years by a coalition of groups of Domestic Workers United and other domestic worker groups basically fighting to secure uh, state protection of minimum overtime way, uh, 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 wage rates, also of uh, a day of rest every, after every seven days of work to include domestic workers to be protected by the New York State human rights law to protect domestic workers. So this is now the law. And so this is now the law and it was the result of an or a sustained organizing campaign by a coalition of domestic workers rights groups. And that's had, had national reverberations because this then spurred other uh, groups of domestic workers and, and uh, to try to create a movement in California, right? And California recently passed a state legislation also passing a similar kind of domestic workers rights bill. So they have some, they have a law and they have some place where they can go and, and make complaints. Yes, yes. So the question is always enforcement right. and the question is enforcement to assert people, right, to, that people know what their rights are. And the question is being able to support workers through organizing campaigns to basically to be able to uh, protect their rights and assert their rights so that we don't have non-enforcement of these laws. That's really the challenge. But besides the domestic workers, I think there's a lot of work that's going on. If we just take the example of New York and we look at the independent worker centers, you know, some of the changes in law that's happening with the, a recognition within the law itself, within various cases, that perhaps the joint employers, the parent companies of big corporations who franchise should also have some accountability to be liable for wage violations and exploitation. That work, those legal changes are only happening because workers and through the independent workers centers are basically uh, forcing those issues to come to the fore, bringing the cases and pushing these cases forward ahead to basically try to open up, to expand uh, protections within the law. Um, I think I said about 13% of New York's population is currently Asian Americans, but one does not see a whole lot of Asian American involvement in politics. There are candidates, Asian candidates who are running. I think what's difficult is that the drawing of district lines, right, for, for electing uh, candidates has a lot to do with the inability of a community to successfully elect a candidate. Uh, to office. Right. And I think that within Chinatown, it's districted in terms of city council representation, uh, I believe, in a, uh, in a district that is a very large district that extends up to, uh, I think it might include the village. And so in that, when the districts are drawn so large, they can dilute the uh, the voting power of a particular community. Right. And that will make it harder for for communities, certain communities of color, to be able to elect uh, uh, candidates of color. Are there a lot of Asian American students at the, at the CUNY Law School, and are they, t do they tend to be interested in working on behalf of, you know, the Asian American community? Yes. Uh, 
our school is very unique, CUNY Law School is very unique, is that, that our service, uh, that our mission is to train public interest law uh, lawyers to go back to the communities that they come from to basically uh, enable people to assert their rights. And our other mission is to create greater access to, to, to the bar. And so for that reason, we have this current class, the current first class, I think is 58% diversity, 63% women. And many, many, the majority of our, of our students, whether they're Asian American students or they come from other racial, ethnic, cultural groups or immigrant groups uh, who are law students at a law school, go back, want to do public interest work. They want to represent people in housing. They want to re represent people who are doing low-wage work. They want to represent people with mental health issues. They want to right, do the span of work of basically giving representation to communities that have been marginalized or if, uh, communities that are low-income communities where uh, facing uh, uh, a lack of access to services and facing exploitation on the job, facing gentrification in their communities. And so, and that's what our mission of our law school is about, is to train people who want to go back to do that work, and, and those are the kinds of students that we attract. In spite of the, uh, some of the uh, serious issues facing Asian American immigrants, I, I was reading, and maybe, maybe it was the Pew Center, um, uh, survey in 2012, I think it was, found that Asian Americans, probably more than any other immigrant groups, are very optimistic about their prospects in the United States, fairly happy with their lives overall, and uh, really believe that this is a country where they can grow and prosper, which is a good thing. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great thing, and that's, I think, shared by many people who who come to the United States, but I think it's also important to remember that life isn't so rosy for many immigrant workers, whether they're coming from Asia, they're coming from Latin America, they're coming from the Caribbean, uh, that life can also be difficult and there are many struggles, but people struggle forth for a better future for themselves and for their children and for the communities that they become a part of when in, in New York City and in the United States. I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Professor Shirley Lung of the CUNY Law School for joining me for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.